Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and a belated entry to our Railways Week, which was last year sometime, I've forgotten exactly when. Um, and it's a, so a solo entry and we're looking at trains, travel and transport in wartime Great Britain. My guest, Peter Steer, is a railway enthusiast and a writer. And folks, if you've found the channel over the last week when I wasn't doing any live stream because I was away on a bit of holiday, welcome aboard to World War II TV. Pardon the pun, it is a railway show. Uh, the information you always uh, will use is in the description below. You'll find links to my merchandise links, the uh, uh, social media channels, etc., etc., etc. Without further ado, I'll bring Peter in. Uh, uh, good evening, good evening Peter. Peter. How are you oh, so I didn't quite catch the question, but uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I would consider myself a railway enthusiast. Uh, was a power engineer during my career, and since retirement, I've, uh, among other things, I've, uh, I produce a Southern Notebook for the Southern Railway Group, and I got an MA in. Uh, railway studies and uh, this presentation was part was started as a dissertation for the MA so but it's grown now grown into a book which uh, is now published it, it, it was when we first started doing this it was due but now it's published Oh, well, you'll have to give me the link so I can add it to the description so folks can find that and um, you know one of the things we found out in the first week is that you know what railway enthusiasts kind of seems to be one set of people and military enthusiasts enthusiast, kind of a different separate set of people but in fact there's a massive great overlap which i think is very interesting but folks um we're going to hand over to peter and take us through the presentation um every few minutes he's going to stop and give a little kind of a, a chance for us to answer ask questions but i think it'll be pretty comprehensive so i don't know how many questions you'll have but i'm going to hand over to peter now to take us through railway travel in world, world war ii thank you right this evening, I'll discuss the public's experience of mobility needs during the war period. The prime intention is to review the civilian, not the military related railway travel. But of course, during the peri this period of national effort, the distinction between the many military and civilian travel needs became somewhat blurred. Many civilians were employed in military related tasks, either as administrators or they're engaged in vital war production work. Also, service personnel who were distributed across the country, far from their family homes, now had new domestic travel needs. This presentation will therefore review the public train services, which were used by both civilian and the military personnel. Here we have a picture of a Southern Railway train about to depart from Waterloo. Any Southern Railway enthusiast will tell you that this is a wartime photograph. The clues are all there. The locomotive shown here is one of the new Merchant Navy class Pacifics, which was introduced in 1942. The railway was authorised to build the first 12 of these during the war, despite them being described by some as deluxe express passenger locomotives. The reason why the government permitted construction, because it had been persuaded that they were intended for mixed traffic, that is passenger and goods, despite the outward appearance of being an elegant express train locomotive. Care was taken to describe the outer casing as being air smoothed, not streamlined, and the use of electric lighting and stylish high-sided tender to match the engine's profile were all glossed over. The for the record, the locomotive is number 21C9 Chaucerville at Waterloo on the 6th of, 6th of May 1943 and is painted in the then standard wartime sombre black livery. Let me just. The subtitle of this talk is Was Your Journey Really Necessary? A title derived from the well designed remembered slogan, Is Your Journey Really Necessary? I will examine the conflict between the government's wish to restrict unnecessary passenger travel during the war years and the increase in the public's need to travel compared to pre war years. Shown here is a classic poster issued in 1942. As will be explained later, it is, in my opinion, a masterpiece of targeted propaganda. A later version was to target a different audience. At the outbreak of the war in 1939, the railways employed the Mass Observation Organisation to survey and report on the public's response to a number of proposed posters. These were intended to dissuade the public from using the trains. The mass observation staff acknowledged that the railways had a fine record of producing high quality posters encouraging more railway travel, 
but now they had to find ways of discouraging railway travel. Six trial posters were shown to members of the public and their, and their reactions tabulated. The final report's recommendations included the desirability of using illustrations, not just words, and that the personal pronoun you or your would easily translate into the viewer's mind as me relating to me. The poster was not included in the original six. It was produced much later in the war, but shows how, how this good advice was taken. On the 1st of September 1939, the railways of Britain were brought under government control. This was achieved using the Emergency Powers Defence Act of 1939, which had only just received its royal assent one week earlier on the 24th of August. Defence Regulation 69 of the Act empowered the Ministry of Transport to take full legal, legal ownership of all the railway company's assets. The government might have been adamant that had taken full control of the railways, but they effectively placed themselves at arm's length from any of the day-to-day -day decisions. The nation's railways were not to be directly administered by the central government's Ministry of Transport, which later became the Ministry of War Transport, as the responsibility of all the routine operational and management functions would be entrusted to the Railway Executive Committee, which I'll usually simply refer to as the REC. This recently conveyed committee was officially a wartime advisory body to the Ministry of Transport and was given the remit to coordinate all the wartime operations of the London Passenger Transport Board, the LPTB, and the four mainline railways, which are often referred to as the Big Four, which were the Southern Railway, SR, the Great Western Railway, GWR, the London Midland Scottish Railway, LMS, and the London and North Eastern Railway, LNER. The 1920s Railway Act had created the Big Four by grouping together all the British railways into four separate companies. During the First World War, an earlier incarnation of the Railway Executive Committee has successfully operated the nation's railways. So successfully, in fact, that the Prime Minister, Lloyd George, was of the opinion that post-war the railways should remain a single unit. In fact, he believed in the wholesale integration of all forms of transport under some form of state control. Many other politicians, which surprisingly included Winston Churchill, also campaigned for railway nationalisation. The rationale for this usually socialist solution was that the railways had become such a central and essential part of public and business life that they should be treated as utilities like the gas and the water, and that any railway fares or rates charge were effectively a tax on commerce. To cut a very long story short, Vested interests were not convinced and a shabby compromise was eventually agreed and the four large private companies were formed. To overcome some of the perceived difficulties, issues, the rates charged by the railways to carry goods were to be fixed and a national wages system would be put into place. As part of the government taking control in 1939, it was agreed that the companies would be guaranteed an income, but which I assume refers to the operating profit, of £40 million a year. If the row was to earn more than £40 million, they would retain the first £3.5 million. If more than £43.5 million was earned, the surplus was to be shared with the government. The £40 million was based on the railway's profits in 1937, not for the last full year 1938, as this was deemed to be an exceptionally bad year. Do need to do some research into why 1938 was a bad year, but whatever. £40 million may seem very not very much money today, but many critics believe that this was far too much to allow them. For, for many years, the railway had not paid out any dividends whatsoever to most of their shareholders. This view ignores two important facts. First, it takes into account no account of the Great Depression of the 1930s, which had a catastrophic effect on railway profitability, particularly for the LMS and the LNER, who lost coal and steel traffic due to the reduction in economic activity. Secondly, railway goods traffic, creating about half of their income, was now unprofitable because the railways could only charge the public rates that had been agreed more than a decade earlier. The burgeoning road hauliers had only to look up the rate to move a commodity and undercut it to get the business. And this, linked to the fact that the railways were unable to set their own wage rates, resulted, resulted in these private companies being unable to control a major cost item, wages, and have no control whatsoever of a chunk of their income, 
that what they could charge to move the goods, which is surely a recipe for early bankruptcy. And the LNER was getting very close to that. The railways were currently promoting the fair deal campaign, agitating for them to be allowed flexibility in rate cha charges. But this controversial issue had not been re resolved in 1939. The way that the Big Four was created in 1920s had a strong bearing on how they responded to the tribulations brought about by the war. Instead of being principally profit-making organisations, they had become effectively public service providers. Now today, the term public service in commercial service circles is often used in a pejorative way, but in many ways working on the railways resembled military service. All of the staff were, were visible to the public, who were visible to the public, wore uniforms, and senior managers were usually referred to as officers. The boards of directors com were composed of men, always men of course, for whom the railway industry was not the main business. These directors were, with a few notable exceptions, mainly politicians, captains of industry, or perhaps much less so by 1939, members of the aristocracy. And so a railway directorship was a secondary activity. Their service on the boards simply polished their reputations. These directors ensure that the railways would never be allowed to make a loss, of course, but large profits were not the main motive. And throughout the war, the railway managers continued to be driven by the pre-war public service ethos, which was often bring them into conflict with the government. The main rec committee, REC committee, was mainly composed of the general managers, I suspect that today we would call them CEOs, from each of the railways. The chairman was Sir Ralph Wedgwood, who was at the time the chief general manager of the LNER. Several sub subcommittees were formed. These were formed of appropriate professional railwaymen. For example, the chief mechanic and Electro -en electrical engineers subcommittee was chaired by no less a personage than Sir Nigel Gresley and was composed of all the railway's chief mechanical and electrical engineers. This all seems like a sensible way to run the nation's vital railways during the war. Even though three years later, civil servants were confused, had to, sorry, they confessed that they had in 1939 been baffled as exactly what the government meant by go taking control. But the day-to-day -day running of the roads is now firmly in the hands of professional railwaymen rather than in the, ha rather than the hands of the directors. Unfortunately, as we shall see, this arrangement did not result in harmony as the, there was often conflict between the REC and the ministry. Wherever there is disharmony and conflict, there are usually issues around personalities. So let us take a quick look at a few personalities. The picture at the top right of the frame is Sir Ralph Wedgwood, the REC chairman. He is shown here as a young man in 1922, but by 1939 he was due to retire from the LNER, but he stayed on to be the REC chairman. When the government became dissatisfied with the REC's performance, it was Sir Ralph who shouldered the blame, as at one cabinet meeting the possibility of sacking him was considered. He did retire in the middle of the war after the government attempted to take a tighter grip on the railways after the reorganisation that created the Ministry of, war, Ministry of War Transport, which is headed up by the arguably more robust minister, Lord Leathers. The gentleman on the top left picture is Herbert Addiscombe Walker, who may, many argue was the finest railway manager of the 20th century. He, despite his relative young age, had been chairman of the earlier version of the Railway Executive Committee during the 1914-18 war. At that time, he was the general manager of the London and South Western Railway and the, at the group, he became the first general manager of the Southern Railway. The rather Poirot-esque figure to the left of the second picture is Gilbert Slumper. He had been the secretary to the 1914 REC under Walker. Gilbert was a civil engineer, not a railway administration expert. Not that being a railway civil engineer is a subordinate position. A railway is a massive piece of civil engineering on, on and through which trains just happen to run. Usually the railway's chief civil engineer was referred to as the engineer. Gilbert was a junior civil engineer for the London South Western Railway, but on the formation of the Southern Railway, he managed part of the new railway shipping interests. Later, Sir Herbert appointed him as his assistant general manager. Note, assistant, not deputy. In this role, he should have got a lot of railway operating experience, but Walker used him as a bag carrier, perhaps. Perhaps he would read his speech as the great man deigned to turn up 
turn up at an event. When Sir Herbert planned a business trip to South Africa, which would naturally take several weeks, out of favour Gilbert, only found out about it from office gossip. During the 1930s, Sir Herbert hinted that he wanted to retire. This spooked the board of directors since they all agreed that Walker was doing an exemplary job. He had taken so much control upon himself that he was seen to be impossible to replace. Various new organisational structures were proposed, but no agreement was ever to be reached. And when Sir Herbert did retire in 1937, all that the directors could agree on was his assistant be promoted. Walker was not long, not away for very long. He soon returned to the Southern Row when he was elected to the board as a non-executive director. That is one of the few notable exceptions that I mentioned earlier. Thus, Gilbert took his seat on the new REC in 1939 as the SR general manager. Standing next to Gilbert and looking slightly bemused is Oliver Vaughan Snell Bullied, OVSB for short. It has been argued that a history of the development of steam locomotives for the use on railways began with Robert Stevenson and ended with Oliver Bullied. It was Bullied who fought for his Merchant Navy locomotives, which, he saw, which we saw in the title frame. Ultimately, according to his biographer, he had to go above the heads of both the REC and the Ministry to make his case for building these locomotives. He had an interview with the Minister of Labour and member for the small wartime cabinet, Ernest Bevan. He talked his minister around to his way of thinking. It was a strange meeting of minds. Bevan, the rough and tough former trade union leader who had been the scourge of the London bus companies and bullied the devoutly religious, cultured right-wing patriot. But Bully's easy-going charm won him the day. The Merchant Navy locomotives were a policy aberration in wartime context when all new development was supposed to cease. Probably only Bullied had the self-belief, charm and determination to win the day. A few days after the formation of the REC, Gilbert Slumper, who like many of his generation was an officer in the Army Reserve, was called up to manage the embarkation of the British Expeditionary Force from Southampton. This was a task that he was well suited for his, due to his wartime experience. It was proposed that an acting general manager be appointed and this was to be Eustace Missenden, pictured bottom right. Missenden, who at the time was Southern Railway's traffic manager, would not accept an acting appointment and dug in his heels to the per for the permanent appointment. Surprisingly, the SR board sided with Missenden and once the BF was safely off to France, poor Gilbert was out of a job. A convenient outcome for the SR board? Who can be sure? Slumber was then brought into the Ministry of Transport to advise on railway matters and be a link with the railway industry. It would be grossly unfair to blame him for all of the friction and lack of cooperation between the Ministry and the REC, but the civil servants probably saw him as an experienced railway expert, while the railways seemed deemed him to be slightly suspect, having been abandoned by the Southern Railway, so he was not a very good go-between. There were, of course, other railway expertise at the Ministry, but these were mainly career civil servants such as the eminent permanent secretary Sir Cyril Herkham, who post-war was to be the chairman of the British Transport Commission after nationalisation. There was also the Railway Inspectorate, responsible for inspecting new railway installations and investigating accidents. Excuse me. The two most senior members of this department were Lieutenant Colonel Mount, and Lieutenant Colonel Trench. Now, if in a comic mood, you might think that Colonel Mount was from the cavalry and Colonel Trench from the infantry. But no, both did their military service with the Royal Engineers. The very valid reason for recruiting from Royal Engineers was that these senior officers were competent engineers who often had experience of running military railways, but they had never worked for any of the civilian railways that they were to inspect or investigate. So therefore there was no conflict of interest. Therefore, they had no experience operating a railway in the commercial world. Mount would attend the meetings, mainly as an observer. Britain had declared war on Germany as the Nazis invaded Poland. It was anticipated that Britain would be subject to savage air raids on the civilian population. Contemporary newsreels being shown in the British cinemas at the time featured the continuing civil war in Spain and the Sino-Japanese war, which had broken out the previous year. The devastating effect of both these conflicts with indiscriminate attacks on non-military targets bore heavily on those entrusted to prepare for a possible mass evacuation intended to move much of the civilian population far away from any of the urban areas likely to be subjected to air raids. 
but Germany was far too occupied in Poland to, Poland to make any significant meaningful attack on Britain. So the nation ended a period of the time referred to, of course, as the phony war. During this period, there were no air, air raids creating damage to the railway lines, but there were air raid warnings halting traffic and there was a complete lighting blackout on all trains. There was, commencing on the very day war was declared, a swift and efficient evacuation of school children. These were carried off peak to minimise the disruption to railway business travel. There was also a swift and efficient movement of troops to France, again by the railways. This was achieved with a minimum disruption to the regular railway services. Most troops left from Southampton, an operation successfully led by Gilbert Slumper. Without any air raids or an invasion, there was no need for a mass evacuation of public from major centres of population. That is, no refugee traffic crowding onto the trains. So why then was traffic entailed? The RAC planned for the worst and hoped for the best. In anticipation of hostilities, the poster shown on the left was published. The curtailment was to provide track capacity for troop and evacuation traffic. Cheap tickets and reservation arrangements were temporarily withdrawn to discourage unnecessary leisure travel. The removal of restaurant cars would allow extra seating capacity on the longer and fewer scheduled trains. Note that a restaurant car was usually two vehicles, a first class car with the kitchen and the third class car. But and this could only be made public at the time, could not be made public at the time, there was a bigger problem affecting the railways. The operation of express good trains had to be curtailed at the outbreak of the war, as it was not possible to run them efficiently during the new, newly imposed blackout conditions. This was because the railway's night workers had to be able to read all of the paper labels or chalk destination notice inscribed upon the various wagons. In normal times, the good sheds and marshalling lads at the city centre depots would have been fully lit during the hours of darkness. The illustration on the right shows a 1939 marshalling yard. Even the use of hand sorry, even the use of handheld torches was forbidden by the area precaution rules, as these would have been raised to, had to be raised to illuminate the labels on the wagons, and would likely to have been spotted by an overflying bomber crew. Thus, there was an unexpected consequence that the total blackout of the goods depots resulted in what had previously been the overnight express goods trains were now having to be marshalled and ran during the daylight hours. These extra day trains were squeezing out the passenger trains on many heavily trafficked routes. Later in the war, partial solutions were found, such as low level approved lighting that did not shine up into the sky and an arrangement that permitted work in the goods yards to cease and all lighting extinguished when either the Royal Observer Corps or the railway's own spotters announced an imminent air raid. <clears throat> there are other reasons why that might be described as additional non-wartime freight traffic was having to be carried by the railways and was consequently adding to the clogging up of the railway network. The images to the top right of the frame gives an impression of the typical coal train which characterized railway working during the steam era <clears throat> the particular photograph is of a great northern railway train at about the time of the grouping but similar photographs might have been taken at any time in the first half of the 20th century here we see a long train of unbraked four-wheel trucks many of which were not be owned by the railway but by the coal merchants despite this almost being almost a cliche as far as the south of England was concerned, such a site was atypical since most of the coal delivered to London, the southeast of England and the south coast towns was not delivered by rail, but arrived on coastal vessels traveling from Tyneside to the south, a sea route following the English east coast, of course. The lower picture shows a pre-war coastal craft, but to be honest, I'm not sure if it was a coal carrier, but at least the picture indicates the size of such vessels. After the declaration of war, the North Sea became a dangerous place for shipping due to the dangers encountering enemy mines, fast patrol boats or U-boats. Furthermore, ships carrying food and other essential cargo destined for the nation's capital had pre-war disembarked their cargoes at the Port of London. And with the outbreak of, the, of war, these vessels also had to avoid the dangerous English Channel and North Sea. The coal destined for London and the south of England now had to be routed overland by extra coal trains. It has been recorded that the East Coast traffic did not completely cease during the war, but very little did come down by this dangerous route. 
in fact while much depleted due to the cessation of trade with the Scandinavian countries coal was the only traffic to be shipped shipped from certain east coast ports during the war general seaborne traffic from the British Empire which which previously had been unloaded at the port of London now had to be routed to the west coast ports such as Liverpool Manchester via the ship canal of course and Glasgow for sh for local short-term warehousing and transfer by goods train southwards this all added to the congestion on British railways all of this before any additional traffic relating to the war that could be accommodated the extra freight traffic necessitated severe restrictions in the number of passenger trains being made available to the public. It is difficult to obtain complete railway statistics for the war period, since due to the shortage of clerical staff, there was a massive reduction in the gathering of such information. This diagram, referencing passenger service in 1941, can, I believe, be taken as a very good representation of the level of service throughout the war years. Earlier at the start of the war, more severe cuts had been made, planning for the worst, hoping for the best again. But by mid-September 1939, some services were restored. The, this diagram does not include the many extra trains which the railways ran at holiday time, such as at Christmas. The amount of these additional trains depended on how critical the situation was at this particular time. The data comes from the railway magazine and was provided by a contributor who wanted to be known simply as Mercury. So it wasn't official data. Spread across the divisions within the railways, there was a reduction in services in the range of 8 to 50 percent. Most affected were the suburban, suburban lines to the south. The least affected were the longer distance services to the north. At the outbreak of the war, the, the REC announced that all restaurant and buffet cars would be withdrawn. This policy fell apart within days. Most of the Southern Railway's catering vehicles were part of mixed formation electric multiple unit sets, so taking one vehicle out of the set made little sense whatsoever. Furthermore, if the railway was allowed to keep its take if this row was allowed to keep its catering vehicles on the shorter routes in southeast England, how would they be able to justify the withdrawal of similar facilities on the much longer steam hauled services to the West Country? The REC wavered. As a result, permission was given to retain the catering vehicles first on the southern, and it was agreed that there would be a review of all catering on trains. This quick review resulted in a reinstatement of many restaurant cars on all four railways. Not as many as pre-war, perhaps, but the catering vehicles were to be used on all the routes which had been used them pre-war. On their cars, the Great Western served a, a breakfast menu price two and six, which is twelve and a half pence, of course. A charge of three shillings, 15p, was charged for the onboard midday and evening lunches, which, incredible as it seems now, offered a soup, fish, roast meat, vegetables and potatoes to be followed by sweets and cheese. The Great Western wine list had to be shortened, but the company claimed that they were, could still offer a variety of wines. On the LNER poster, shown, not shown here, so as to be able to serve the maximum number of meals in the minimum amount of time, its new wartime menu offered what they described as simple meals costing two and sixpence being served. On the LMS, restaurant cars were provided on 50 trains every day, and it too provided simplified menus and introduced a standard charge of two and sixpence for all meals, whether breakfast, lunch or dinner, except its standard tea, which cost travellers a shilling. Sandwiches could be purchased for a shilling also. It has claimed that due to wartime conditions, it had reduced the cost of meals to two and six in order to simply farm milk provision and to take due account of the much reduced variety of ingredients being offered. A service charge was added to the menu as passengers were no longer expected to tip the waiters, but all of the new service charge income was to be passed on to the staff. But in 1942, the Ministry, now the Ministry of War Transport, agreed that all restaurant cars must be withdrawn. The railway fought back against this edict, and it was finally agreed that a very limited number of cars would be operated each day. <coughs> the severe reductions were made on all four railways. The Southern Railway had to withdraw all of its catering vehicles from its electric multiple unit sets and were only allowed to run six cars a day, three in each direction between Waterloo and Exeter. Nonetheless, the surviving restaurant cars did very good business, 
During October 1942, for example, the 8.30 a.m. Euston to Holyhead train, which was used by passengers to North Wales and Ireland, served 5,706 breakfasts, 5,635 luncheons, 9,353 teas and morning coffees. All restaurant cars were redrawn after Whitson 1944. This was mainly due to a further tightening of passenger service in the lead up to D-Day, but also due to a lack of staff and shortage of suitable foods off ration. Has anybody any questions or comments? I think we're good at the moment. There'll be some questions later on, Peter, but I think at the moment, just the power on the, the questions we have are kind of a general ones, I think. Moving on then. During the war, there were many new reasons for members of the public to travel on the railways, and the more significant ones will be examined later. But one new need was for parents to visit their evacuated children. As it turned, and as it turned out, to collect them, to bring them home. Parents wanted to vis visit their children to ensure that all was well. The local authorities and the Ministry of Health who had organised the evacuation worried, quite correctly, that parental visits would result in children being brought back into the danger areas. The railway companies, however, sided with the public and made it known that they were prepared to run special trains, at commercial rates, of course. The Ministry of Health's worst fear, fears were realised as most children who had been evacuated in September 1939 had all returned home by Christmas. This was due in part to the phony war. Why separate families when there are no bombs falling? A second evacuation, not so well publicised, did take place just before Dunkirk, when the international situation was deteriorating. The numbers of children who were officially evacuated by the local authorities have been well documented, but there is no full record, only anecdotal evidence or of the probably thousands of children evacuated privately by their parents. After questions were asked in Parliament, special arrangements were agreed between the Ministry of Health, the local authorities and the REC facilitating parents' visit to their evacuated children. First, a voucher system was introduced which provided half price, price travel on Sundays only and was only available to parents who had been had their children evacuated by the local authority. This scheme proved to be a failure as too many mistakes were made during the voucher issuing. Special excursions were organised at commercial rates by the railways. Note that other excursions were banned by the government. The destinations and stopping points of these special trains provide an insight into where the safe rural locations that accepted the children were. The map shows typical destinations between Paddington and small towns destinations in Wiltshire and Somerset. There was also a two day special to Gilestown in South Wales. Other typical special trains run from Euston to Leighton Buzzard, Bletchley and Weedon and from Kings Cross to small communities north of London, Sandy, St Neots and Huntingdon. Later, an update of the voucher system enabled parents or other relatives to travel at any time, but only on out and back journey for a single day. Necessary travel. There were new wartime and mobility needs. Evacuation. The first evacuation of children from London and other cities has been widely documented. Not so the many other evacuations in 1939 and 40. These included the relocation of government departments away from London, the relocation of military headquarters away from London, the creation of new government establishments such as at Bletchley Park, the evacuation of important industries away from potential bombing targets, the evacuation of cultural and educational institutions such as the Slade School of Art away from potential bombing targets, evacuation of trade union of, of unions offices to the provinces such as the NUR's relocation to Wallingford and not forgetting the railway headquarters that moved out of London, the Southern Railway to Dorking and the Great Western Railway to Aldermaston. But here are a few significant examples. Bath became the home, the new home for the Royal Navy. Bath Bar Spa Station is 94 miles from Paddington by the Great Western Main Line via Swindon and Chippenham. Despite the sensitivity of the transfer of Admiralty staff to Bath, 
Many of the city's residents had been forewarned of the move during the Munich crisis the previous year. When war was declared in 1939, a local solicitor wrote to Winston Churchill, who was then First Lord of the Admiralty, of course, complaining that Bath was unable to house any more evacuees since they were already expand, expecting hundreds of school children to be evacuated from the danger areas and they would soon arrive in the city, which is already full of civilian, extra civilian residents who had decided that Bath was likely to be a safe location to live during the coming conflict. This is one of the many references that can be found referring to those who had self-evacuated without any assistance from the local authorities or had been moved to the provinces due to their wartime, the wartime relocation of their workplaces. Bath was seen by many as a safe location that, that was not too far away from the capital by train. These people most would most likely have added to total extra wartime rail journeys, either on their initial relocation or by receiving family visitors to their wartime homes. At the beginning of the war, the mayor of Bath wrote, to all residents pleading for accommodation for the new influx, the influx of government staff. Incredibly, for such a secret operation, a formal letter requesting assistance was attributed to every household in the city. These letters had a heading written in bold letters stating that these contents were private and confidential to households of the city of Bath. Upon reading the letter, the patriotic citizens of Bath were instructed to burn the document after perusal. Imagine such a secret letter being distributed in these days of social media. The difficulties in, in arranging sufficient billets for the newcomers onto the city at very short notice did cause delays in relocating the Admiralty staff to Bath. Nonetheless, nearly 4,000 staff members were transferred to Bath in the first few days of the war. Most travelled by special trains from Paddington on two Sundays to as far as possible avoid affecting the normal services. The evacuees not only carried their own suitcases on the trains, but were also requested to provide and carry their own bedding. The Admiralty decreed that no special air raid precautions, precautions such as barrage balloons or obvious anti-aircraft batteries be installed so that the new HQ could effectively hide in plain sight. Departments that moved to Bath included the Secretariat, the Research and Experiment Department, Contracts and Purchase and the Purchase Office, the Chief Engineer and his staff, the Chief Inspector of Naval, Ordin Naval Ordnance, the Inspector of Torpedoes and Mines with his Torpedoes and Mining Department and the Navy's Electrical Engineering Section. Also at Bath were staff engaged in naval construction, hydrography, signals, fiddling and stores, dockyard administration, exchequer and audit. For office accommodation, at first much use was made of the many requisitioned hotels about the city and later school premises across the wider Bath locality. The Admiralty staff themselves were billeted in private houses or, mainly for the many young female clerks, in hostels. It was expected that senior staff would frequently be required to travel to Whitehall for meetings and briefly a fast car service was considered but due to the numbers travelling and the speed and convenience of the Great Western Service to Paddington, such business travel was to be made by train. Less senior staff would also found the GWR route to London useful for their not so very frequent but very welcome visits home. If the lack of air raids on Bath are an indication, it would seem that the Germans never realised just how important Bath was as a military target. Some sporadic Bombing did occur, however, a few bombs were dropped on the city during 1940 and 1941. But in 1942, Bath became the target for a number of, of retaliatory raids by the Luftwaffe. These were part of the so-called Baydecker raids, which were launched in retaliation to the RAF's attacks on Rostock and Lübeck. Bath was therefore in grave danger, and for two nights the historic centre was to suffer air raid damage to many of the culturally important buildings, such as houses along the Royal Crescent and Bath Abbey. At Bath Spa Station, a German bomb landed on one of the platforms. The explosion damaged, damaged both station buildings and all four tracks through the station. Damage to rolling stock was also reported. Two wagons were destroyed and others damaged. The station water supply also suffered damage. 
but perhaps most important, the death, poll, death toll over the two nights of these raids was 417. Whilst all of the evacuated Admiralty staff at the Bath sites had no non-combat roles, many of the male staff members joined the 6th Bath Admiralty Battalion of the Somerset Home Guard. These part-time soldiers wore the cap badge of the regiment to which they were affiliated, the Somerset Light Industry Infantry. Despite having naval connections, the brigade nonetheless wore the army khaki uniform. Several members of the Bath Home Guard were decorated for their bravery during the, the air raids in 1942. One of these, Mr J.A. Leslie, a former sales representative on loan to the Bath Royal Navy Secretariat, was awarded the George Cross for his part in rescuing several people trapped in the basement of a damaged and still smouldering hotel. While the Royal Navy moved westwards to Bath, the Yorkshire spa town of Harrogate in the north became the new home for the RAF. Harrogate Station is 180 miles from King's Cross by the LNER main line. In September 1939, staff from the Air Ministry headquarters at Barclay Square House in London were immediately evacuated to Harrogate. This proved to be a safe location during the war as only a single bomb was ever to be dropped on the town and this was from a stray raider and Harrogate was most probably not the intended target. Was the existence of RAF Harrogate a well-kept secret or was it just too difficult for the Luftwaffe to pinpoint the important targets within the town? Initially, the Air Ministry staff evacuated included those from the supply branch and the Directorate of Equipment. It had been proposed to move 3,000 staff but this was later increased to 3,500. Most of these arrived at Harrogate by special trains from King's Cross. What was loosely to be, to be described as RAF Harrogate eventually comprised of staff of the Air Ministry's Signal Service and General Administration, the Number 7 Personnel Reception Centre. This was a very important, as this was the home of the Allied Pilots Training Scheme, through which hundreds of pilots received their tuition in Harrogate almost certainly arriving and leaving by train. There was the RAF, there was the Air Ministry's Communications Unit and the WAF Headquarters and Training Establishment. During 1940 and 1941, all new WAF recruits would arrive by train at Harrogate for enlistment and training. The then very new Air Ministry building in central London did not remain empty. Such was the increase in staff during the war that Barclay Square House was soon to be described as being full up. Harrogate also became the home of the regional office for the Ministry of Aircraft Production and the location of the GPO's regional office. The staff who had been evacuated to Harrogate seemed to slot into three distinct groups. The top level being the most senior staff who could afford to move their whole family northwards into rented accommodation in the Yorkshire Spa Town. They were in a win-win situation, for not only was the officer safely away from the London Blitz, but so too was his wife and children. A very strong social group developed in the town, organising clubs and Christmas parties for the children, etc. This group had little need for railway travel, except for the officers' business trips to London. The least senior group, mainly young female clerks and typists, suffered from isolation from their friends and families as they were so far away from their homes in the London area. They were given occasional travel concessions for visits home, but too much of any of the minimal leave time that they were granted was taken up by the long train journey home. Between these two groups were men who could not afford or were otherwise unable to bring their families to Harrogate, but still had the financial commitment to maintain their family and household nearly 200 miles away in the south. It was recognised that these men were suffering financial and emotional hardship due to being evacuated to Harrogate. Colwyn Bay became the new home for the Ministry of Food. Colwyn Bay Station is 200 miles from Euston by the LMS main line. Compared to the smooth transition of the activities of the Royal Navy and the RAF to the provinces, the Ministry of Food's removal to North Wales was an unmitigated disaster. The fracturing of the traditional London order had led to the breaking up of the established Ministry of Food branches and different groups of civil servants had blatantly reorganised themselves into new auto autonomous groups which inevitably led to an increase in staff when all of the pre-war control from the centre was lost. Each section seems to have gone its own way, setting up offices spread around Colwyn Bay. 
These departments also suffered from an influx of what Vera Breton had a quarter of a century before the Great War described in the Great War described as dugouts, that is, ancient, previously retired volunteers working without pay in the belief that it was their duty to take part in the war effort. It was not uncommon for these advisers to take up residence in one of the newly established offices in Colwyn Bay without any knowledge of the establishment officers who would not know of their presence for several weeks and by that time they were recruited additional paid clerical staff. Was any new when any new special problem arose, these out-of-control civil servants' immediate reaction was to set up another section to work on the issue and thereby create further increase in lower-grade staff who live locally. There was a total of 4,360 Ministry of Food staff at Colwyn Bay, of whom 1,189 worked in the Trade and Finance Department. Only 322 Ministry staff remained in London, but there was 356 others outposted to Oxford. Unfortunately, the local Colwyn Bay residents saw the civil servants as an invading army. They were quick enough to accept payment to accommodate them. The area had plenty of rooms as it was a holiday town, but then they were also quick to evict them during the holiday periods when they could rent the same rooms for more money. During the summer, as many as five ministry workers might be packed into a single room. Morale was very low amongst the ministry staff, particularly for the younger females. These, the senior civil servants, showed little sympathy for the plight of these young ladies, many of whom became very depressed. The worst affected were the many typists, for while many young men and women were recruited locally for duties such as messengers, and in reality spent a lot of wasted time hanging around for, waiting for something to do, in contrast the typists evacuated from London had to cope with an increased workload, and the attempts of senior managers to make them work longer hours failed to completely to appreciate the needs of young single females who were far from their home without the support of their families. For example, they could not work on Saturdays, as it was the only day when they were able to do their shopping for essentials. It is no surprise that, despite the prospect of a long rail journey, the younger staff members craved home lead, leave. Later in the war, the Ministry set up a street that's just the strategic war room at Colwyn Bay to be made operation in the event of G Germany invading, which seemed to be set up rather late in the in the day, but there you go. Other government departments evacuated to North Wales or the northwest of England included the Royal Artillery's Coast Gunnery School, which was established on the Great Orm at Londedno, the Ministry of Works and Buildings transferred staff to work in offices at Liverpool. The Indian Revenue worked from several of Land Dudno's hotels, including the Imperial Hotel. The BBC radio studios, while not new to the area, during the war much of the light programme output was switched to North Wales, including the famous comedy show It's That Man Again, Itma. The huge increase in government business carried out during the war in North Wales created large amounts of business travel on the railway. You will recall that one of the last restaurant car service ran by the LMS was between Euston and Holyhead and was very popular with the passengers. Bletchley Park was to the new home for the Code and Cipher School. That was the official name for the famous Bletchley establishment. While I've never seen any official confirmation as such, the proximity of the nearby railway station was surely a factor in selecting Bletchley Park to be the centre of the code-breaking establishment. Bletchley Station is 44 miles from Euston by the LMS main line. It was also the midpoint of the LMS Cambridge to Oxford Varsity line. Cambridge, where such notables as Alan Turing was based, was only 45 miles away and in the other direction was Oxford. In 1939 there were fewer than 200 people working at Bletchley. But by 1944 this had risen to almost 10,000. This generated considerable passenger traffic for the LMS. There was plenty of business travel to and from London, but staff were generally billeted close to Bletchley and arrived by bus, bicycle or walked. Almost three quarters of the staff were women. Some were civilians who had been covertly recruited from a pool of young ladies who had attended the very best private schools, while the Royal Navy provided women who had enlisted in the Women's Royal Navy Service, Wrens, and were posted to Bletchley. All would have initially arrived by train at Bletchley and would have regularly used the railways for leave journeys home. A feature of the work at Bletchley was that civilian and military personnel worked side by side at the establishment. As staff numbers increased, 
They were often to be billeted at remote locations. Later, the LMS provided a commuter train service to and from Bedford, time to suit Bletchley Park's shift cycle. Um, before I go on to the Blitz, any comments, questions? Yeah, I have a question for me. The, the people working at the various, various ministries and departments who are moved out of London, if they're going home on leave, do they just have to kind of just make their way on the trains as any regular civilian, or do they have certain hours they are suggested to use or or priority or lack of priority? How did it work? They they were given, it varied throughout the war, but typically they got um, two or three passes home a year where they paid half price. Right, right. So they uh, they weren't left completely. They were given some help to go home. Okay, thanks. Well, um, back to you. Brilliant stuff. The Blitz. I will divert away for a moment to discuss the effects of Blitz on passenger rail travel. Many books have been written about the war damage to the railways, particularly around London. The period described as the Blitz is usually taken as between September the 7th, 1940 until May the 11th, 1941. But the bombing of the railways continued afterwards, including the bombing of, bombing of Middlesbrough Station in August 1942, as shown here. The railway companies did a superb job running their trains to what can only be described as a war zone. Delays were not so much due to actual bomb damage on the railways, but more often due to unexploded bombs on or adjacent to railway land or fires or damaged buildings about to collapse against the railway boundary. These often resulted in multiple trains being held at signals many miles away from the actual incident. But there was many inst instances of significant damage to the railway infrastructure. For the Southern Railway, one of the worst nights was on the 7th of September 8, 1940. Commuters took refuge in the public shelters at Waterloo Station, but found when they emerged in the morning, all traffic from Waterloo had ceased due to a direct hit on the line between Waterloo and Vauxhall. This had opened up a 50 foot wide crater spanning six of the eight running lines and leaving the other two severely damaged. This was probably the worst disruption to passenger traffic as this, one of the busiest of the London termini, was closed until 19th of September, almost two weeks later. Following any air raid, the Southern's regular commuters had to be made aware of where enemy action had caused disruption. So the railway established travel information posts at kiosks at its most important stations. To further assist the travelling public, the Southern Railway also made arrangements for the latest travelling information to be available at a number of local shops. By providing up-to-date information, it was hoped that their regular passengers would be able to avoid fruitless journeys to their usual station on a day when it was often possible to travel by any of the alternate services that the railway were able to offer near to their homes. And the Southern Railway's network was very tight and complex in those days, though often alternate routes. The Southern Railway's extensive electrified network suffered severe difficulties due to Luftwaffe attack on its Dernsford Road generating station on the 14th of October 1940. This power station provided about half of the electricity used by the Southern Electric Suburban Services. A German bomb struck one of the station's chimneys and caused serious damage to the boilers below, thereby severely reducing the station's output. Within a few days, the water supply was not yet fully restored, but 10,000 kilowatts, about one third of the station's maximum output, was available. And a fortnight later, the situation did improve when it's reported that 21,000 kilowatts was now available. Due to the wartime timetable, fewer trains were being run on the suburban lines. But during the electricity supply, electric supply emergency, those that were running had to travel at a slower speed because the reduced electrical capacity available resulted in a much lower voltage on the conductor rails at many locations. The passengers on these dawdling electric trains suffered double because to further save on their precious electricity, the train heating fuses had been removed. During December 1940, the main line into Euston suffered relatively little direct damage except for one very serious incident at Queen's Park Station, four miles north of Euston, on Tuesday the 3rd of December. At 10.07pm, a bomb fell on the local electric lines, killing two of the railway staff and five passengers. Debris covered all six of the running lines through the station. Despite these upsetting circumstances, staff promptly cleared all of the lines and the fast line was back in service as early as 1058 
not on the LMS main line, but at Caledonian Road and Barnsbury Station at 7.20 p.m. on the 8th of December, a bomb fell directly onto an electric train on its way from Broad Street to Watford, killing four of the passengers and a further seven receiving injuries. An LMS staff member was also killed and the train guard was injured. The station was closed to all traffic until 3.30 p.m. the following afternoon. These sample incidents clearly illustrate the magnificent work of the railway staff to keep the trains moving. It was presumed by the government that during the Blitz there had been a huge reduction in the traffic on the railways. But one senior civil servant did his research and using what information, information he could gather and decided this showed a, and showed a less bleak picture. I've represented some of his calculations on this graph. By train miles, which is the uh, the top line, I've assumed this relates to all rail traffic, passenger and goods, and it can be seen that traffic was dipping significantly through 1938. Again, not completely sure why more research needed, but there was a start of a revival before the outbreak of war, and this trend continued into 1940. And while it faltered at the time of the Blitz, train miles had, been, had risen well above pre-war levels. As for passenger receipts, the decline in 1938 was noticeable but not significant. At the start of the war, there was a decrease in passenger travel. The graph seems to indicate before the war started, but lack of data points is probably distorting the graph. But after an initial reluctance to travel, the various new reasons which we're highlighting to travel start to kick in. This trend continues to rise, albeit at a lesser rate through the Blitz period. My conclusion is, is that journeys might have been disrupted during the Blitz, but the delayed trains almost always reached their intended destinations. Returning to the additional requirements for travel during the war period, a new need arose, which was to carry out manufacture of essential war equipment in remote and safe locations. With the war not lost, the focal change to the intention to win the war, which would of course entail the invasion of Europe. So the nation prepared for the massive assault on mainland Europe on D-Day in June 1944. This resulted in the urgent need to manufacture armaments, etc. in secret factories spread across the country. This massive preparation for invasion to go with the arrival of the American army all became part of what is what was to be called Operation Bolero. Many of the new factories were all Royal Ordnance Factories, ROF, while others were the expansion and diversification of existing privately owned manufacturing companies, often away from their traditional locations, having moved out into the countryside to the supposedly safer locations. This required the railways to provide additional trains to carry the war workers to their new factory locations. For example, in April 1944, the REC gave approval for a special train of 300 workers to, con to convey them from their wartime works in Coventry and Birmingham, Birmingham to Barnoldswick in East Lancashire. This part of England had become the host for, for companies such as electrical component manufacturer and car makers Rover, who converted what had been cotton mills into factories for their wartime activities. At Barnoldswick, the early jet engine W2 was developed by Rover to Frank Whittle's design. In 1943, it was decided that the Rolls-Royce company would step in to take over the Rover factories to produce the RB23 well-end jet engine. In 1944, the first jet engine to be designed and built at Barnaswick was the RB41 Neen. Before we move on to the next bit, looking at the passenger, is anything else? Um... No, I think I'll all I'll say the one ask other ones at the end of it. It will just they're, they're, none of them are about what you're doing right now. They're general ones. So I think back to you. Oops, so Daisy, let me do the right slide. Meanwhile, how has all this extra passenger traffic impacted on the level of passenger comfort for the trains? Remember, more people were travelling on the railways, which were operating significantly fewer passenger service than in peacetime. I'll put up on the screen here a quote written by Angus Calder in 1969. And I don't quite agree with it, but he succinctly sums up what I would describe as the folk memory of railway travel during World War II. He said that railway travel was three times as expensive as before the war, 
yet it was probably three times as uncomfortable. Reservations were no longer permitted. There were usually no restaurant cars. If trains were not cancelled, they were likely to be late. Sometimes it was literally impossible for a grown man to force his way into corridors already jammed with weary war workers and servicemen on leave. Which is almost all true, but only for some of the time. Not, I don't think all of the time. At various times, the railways carried out passenger number surveys on their busiest services. And I should stress that this was done on the busiest services. This graph that I've prepared here is based on a Great Western Railway survey of trains running between Paddington and South Wales in 1941. You will see that each graph has got a line that shows where the full capacity of the train is. It will be noted there was always spare seats in the first class compartments. Only the 11.55 a.m. from Paddington comes close to being full. As for the poor third class passengers, two of the trains had plenty of spare seats available for them, but two of the trains can justifiably be described as crowded, so that people would have had to have been standing in the vegetables and corridors, but not necessary for all the journey. The railway have a, did the survey of the 1.15 p.m. train at Swindon. Perhaps this was because they they viewed this as the busiest part of the journey after more passengers had joined at, say, Reading. I find this graph in interesting because in many respects this could represent the situation today when riding on the new so-called GWR services in the uncomfortable Hitachi sets. Perhaps to get complete correspondence to modern day travel, the columns could be swapped such as the busy times were during the commuter hours and the quieter time trains during the day. But this might not be so due to the change in travelling habits after the COVID pandemic. As showed on the last slide, generally the railways were coping with the demand, but the government began to put pressure on the REC to reduce passenger numbers as they foresaw the inevitable increase in demands for military traffic, both military goods being moved to the south coast and the many special troop trains, all part of Operation Bolero. And the military need was only to increase dramatically over the next two or three years. The Ministry of Transport, now morphing into the Ministry of War Transport, began to take a more aggressive attitude towards the REC and demanded a reduction in passenger numbers on British railways. The railway companies were not impressed by some of the proposals from the government. The Ministry suggested goods trains to be given priority over known bot uh, through known bottlenecks, to which the REC's response was, it's been tried before, this resulted in even more congestion and delays to services. It was suggested that the railways produce a one-way traffic arrangement, that is, tracks in both directions on a double track line to be used to carry traffic in the same direction for part of the time. The Rex response to all this was utter nonsense, as it would require major alterations to stations and signals. The Ministry asked, why not have non-travel days for passengers? The REC response was that, that there would be much less inconvenience to the public if there was to be a level decrease across the week rather than as, apply severe reductions only on certain days. Why not introduce a system of limited trains as this would restrict the number of passengers on each service? The REC response was this was that it would be difficult to implement and only be possible on a limited number of trains. A system which controlled the number of tickets issued on a first-come, first-served basis will be both unpopular and unfair. Would it be possible to introduce some form of permit to travel system? In the REC's view, this decision to introduce such a bureaucratic scheme would require the difficult appraisal of the most likely effect on passengers' total numbers relative to the number of precious railway staff required to manage the scheme. Why not abolish discounted fares, such as cheap day returns? To this suggestion, the railway's commercial instincts kicked in. This would likely be detrimental to business travel. In this case, however, the railways were to be overruled later, as the Ministry banned the cheap day returns, rightly seeing them as only being used mainly for discretionary airshare travel, and arguably this act contributed to Calder's assertion that the railway travel was so much more expensive during the war. The REC did have some proposals to reduce passenger numbers due to the predicted increase in war-related goods traffic on the railways. The REC insisted that the government should tax long-distance rail travel. 
it was proposed that a 100% tax should be imposed on tickets for any journey over 30 miles. The REC taught, saw taxation as a very attractive solution, as any tax would be levied by the government, not the railways, so it would be the government that would incur the blame for the cost increase and not the railway companies. Mm. Yeah. This was promptly rejected by the Ministry. The only option offered by the REC was to continue to allow passengers to go as you please, and if further inductions proved to be necessary, there would be the consequential overcrowding. It was hoped that the public would accept the trains would be crowded and those with unnecessary journeys would stay away. This was to be effectively the solution, but the REC, despite being dismissive of all other options, saw this as an admission of defeat. Furthermore, the REC argued that they were legally obliged to carry that any traffic which presented itself. It was in this spirit that the Is Your Journey Really Necessary campaign came into being. Note that the potential travellers in this version of the famous poster are not munition workers on their way to their workplace in a remote factory, businessmen endeavouring to keep an essential business working, senior civil servants travelling to remote government offices for important meetings, servicemen on weekend passes returning to base after visiting their loved ones at home, perhaps never to see them again if posted to a war zone, worried parents visiting their evacuated children, or distraught young ladies on leave from places such as Harrogate who were emotionally drained from living and working so far from home. The poster shows a middle-class, most probably retired couple travelling to perhaps to do some shopping or to take their little dog for a walk in the country, obviously not necessarily travel. The RAC also argued that most of the war train traffic inside was outside of their control, as so many people were travelling on government subsidised tickets government travellers they described it and in particular service personnel travel during the war years in the nation's armed forces can i start that again during the war years personnel in the nation's armed forces had many new wartime mobility needs these were not necessarily met by the many troop movement trains which were provided by the railways such as following the retreat from dunkirk and the later D-Day preparations. With the military personnel posted in at so many new and diverse locations, there was an increase in both leave travel to and from more remote locations and the soldiers' home and what might be described as military business travel. Actual additional recruitment into the services created more travel on the railways as new recruits journeyed to, tra to training establishments, such as the WAS to Harrogate, and then travel on to their units when posted. The poster shown here shows a heavily laden soldier complete with all his kit. Despite the offer of space to leave their luggage in the guard's van, the soldiers were personally responsible for all of the kit that had been issued to them and fearing pilfering needed to keep it with them at all times. Some passengers became spooked finding rifles in the luggage racks. It was reported in Parliament that a soldier on a leave journey, either to or from his base, had to take with him all of his kit as he had to remain a fighting unit at all times. Perhaps this was true during leave journeys. Why then does pictures of railway stations during the war show crowds of service personnel without kit as parody, parodied in this poster? The answer to this question is that service personnel enjoy concessionary rates to travel by train, the return journey for the cost of a single journey ticket. This concession was extended to American troops when they arrived and was also available with some conditions to servicemen's families. The chart shows on the red bottom line number of warrants issued in 1942 and 1943 for railway travel by service personnel making official journeys, such as, for example, travel from the initial training camp to the first post at a different location. Perhaps we should call this military business travel. The blue line, second from the bottom, shows the warrants issued for leave travel on the railways. The purple line shows the number of tickets issued at concessionary rate paid for by the soldier for his own personal travel needs. During the war, to avoid being seen as a conscientious objector, it was best to be in uniform when travelling, even if on leave, hence the high number of people at stations in uniform without kit. The top line shows the combined total of all three types of travel. It will be noted that the concessionary fares are the major contribution to the total service travel. But how do these service journeys compare with the total railway journeys on the supposedly overcrowded trains? 
This chart compares the ticket sales sold to service staff to the ordinary full fare and monthly return issued by the railways in October 1942 and in for comparison in October 1943. The first point to note is a continued gradual increase in all rail travel despite efforts to reduce this by the Is Your Journey Really Necessary campaign. In 1942, the service personnel travel, which is the yellow line, is less than half the full single ticket sales, which is the blue line. But one year later, it's increased to half, despite the increase in civilian single journey usage. Not quite the full picture, since not counted are the much used workman's tickets and the season ticket sales. Workman's tickets probably increased as the war continued when more factories were established in remote areas, but the railways did report a significant slump in the number of season ticket holders at the beginning of the war. Did all of these service personnel travelling in uniform overcrowd the trains? This chart shows the results of another traffic survey, this term in October 1941 by the Southern Railway on trains between Waterloo and Bournemouth. Again, you see the capacity lines are way above anything. A strange choice for such a survey, Waterloo to Exeter might have been better as Salisbury was at the midpoint of this route and an obvious destination for troops on their way to training facilities on Salisbury Plain. But perhaps the railway wanted a more representative route to indicate the level of service travel rather than a special case. The chart shows, and again this is only a representative selection, that none of the trains could be deemed full as a, and that between 40% third class in the 11.45pm departure and 100% first class on the 1.20pm departure, the only train in the survey to show a train, any part of the train to full capacity of the seats, these seats were occupied by passengers in service uniform. It will be noted too that one of the trains, the lightly loaded 11.20 a.m. is a relief train indicating that even if the railway had to reduce service during the war, relief trains not shown in the printed timetable could be run to cope with any anticipated busy periods. These charts combine the service carried out by the Big Four in October 1944. Four, 1941, sorry. The First on the left hand side is a summary of all the SR Waterloo Bournemouth data from the last frame. The second is a summary of the situation on the west coast main line of the LMS. Unfortunately the files at Kew do not give as much detail as they do for the SR records but a similar story is shown. Again we're not up to capacity but ooh, the number of service personnel is very nearly got to the same as the others. The Great Western data gives again gives information about the percentage of travellers in uniform, but we can see that this is much less so than the other railways, but it's significant nonetheless. The LNER data shows more travellers in uniform than any other railway, but unfortunately only gives a clue to the available seating, but it would seem that there was a significant overcrowding on the trains leaving King's Cross for the northeast. If it was a severe overcrowding on these trains, often due to soldiers with all of their kit returning home from leave to bases in Yorkshire, which caused questions to be asked in the House of Commons by concerned MPs. I spoke to one firm, former soldier who had experience of travel on this route, and he told me that on these trains it was impossible to move about due to the soldiers' kit blocking access to corridors and toilets. He also incidentally remarked that trains to his hometown, Cheam in Surrey, were not at all crowded. The, the King's Cross to Yorkshire trains seem to have been a hot spot for service travel and it is most likely that this has contributed to the folk memory of crowded wartime trains by, by those who travelled on them or who read the parliamentary reports in the press. This matter was resolved, however, when it was decided to promote special train leave trains on this route. These extra trains were run, were run for service personnel only and had buffet cars manned by NAFE staff. They were conveniently timetabled to run in front of the Flying Scotsman Express to enable servicemen to transfer to other services which were advertised to connect with the Scotsman's wartime multiple stop schedule. Definitely not a crack non-stop express during the war.
1991, Angus Calder published his book, The Myth of the Blitz, which contributed to the which contract contradicted the popular view that during World War II, the British people worked tirelessly in unison to defeat the enemy. He confronted the populist vision of a nation in which every loyal citizen gallantly contributed to the war effort and stoically accepted all the deprivations. The front cover of his book, shown here, graphically depicts what he saw as the myth of the bliss, Blitz, a propaganda picture showing a jolly milkman going about his usual business after a raid. This picture was posed and was a complete fabrication. The last thing this bombed out street needed was a milk delivery and the milkman was the photographer's assistant. Calder and others have provided many examples of disunity cutting across the accepted mythology, citing dissenting po politicians, trade unions and the continuing IRA activity, together with social problems that were generated, including the many conflicts between those evacuated and their hosts, such as the overcrowding and complaints about dirty habits of the refugees. Other examples of lack of national cooperation that he focuses on are the reports of looting, profiteering and black market activities. The myth of the Blitz was to be perpetuated by the many popular war films depicting brave Britons with stiff upper lips that were released during the, and after the war. None of these scholars have given emphasis to petty pilfering that took place on trains or at railway stations. The Southern Railway claimed that thousands of light bulbs and fittings had been stolen from their trains. The thieves had stolen the lampshades, which were very necessary in order to maintain the blackout conditions. The Southern had successfully prosecuted 26 individuals who had been duly, duly fined up to £5 plus costs. They requested that its passengers assisted with the keeping the train lights on by reporting to a member of the staff anybody seen stealing bulbs and other fittings. These bulbs would be of the wrong voltage, of course, but I suspect they could be used at home if a number were connected in series. Many of the stolen bulbs were probably the blackout blue bulbs, which gave the eerie ghostly light that made everybody look rather ill. The lighting of trains during blackouts was an emotive issue. At the start of the war, before supplies of the blue bulbs were available, passengers had to endure, endure totally unlit trains, not acceptable to women in particular when travelling on the commuter trains in complete darkness. At a Southern Railway shareholders meeting in March 1940, the directors were told that many passengers believed that the blackout restrictions had been imposed just to annoy them. A bit bizarre, but it was still the phony war period before the Blitz began. The railways did equip some long distance trains with wooden shutters and special lampshades to direct the light directly downwards to allow passengers to read. But while this brought a lot of good publicity, this solution was impractical as carriages and that had multiple was, was impractical on carriages that had multiple opening doors. But improvements to train lighting were very slow. As late as 1943, the Ministry of Home Security pronounced that good lighting would be available to all passengers. But this was greeted with scepticism and disbelief by the travelling public as very little had been done to provide adequate lighting during the blackout. Other commodities began to disappear from the train toilet compartments and the public lavatories at the stations. Solid soap was being rationed and consequently this quickly disappeared resulted in the provision of this type of soap being discontinued on the 23rd of February 1942. If the railways could obtain liquid or powder soap, this would be fried as an alternative. There was a similar issue with the disappearance of toilet paper, but the railways did continue to provide this essential item. Given that it was the generally better off in society who dined on the trains, it is perhaps surprising that the freshly laundered linen napkins were also disappearing from the restaurant cars, and consequently the railways soon had a shortage of these, and they too had to be withdrawn. In the months before the ine inevitable decision to withdraw the linen items, these were, was reluctantly made, the railway staff had resorted to reducing the size of and carrying out dining repairs on them. Also going missing from the restaurant cars and station booths was large quantities of crockery, often marked with the railway's logo. For those interested in the train picture, I believe this photograph was taken just after the war, but it's nonetheless a typical war picture. The locomotive hauling a very long train is one of Sir William Stania's Coronation Class Pacifics and does look rather war weary. The original splendid blue or red livery enhanced by yellow bands has been replaced with a drab plain black. The tender has been exchanged for a non-streamlined type. 
From 1947, the streamlined casing was to be removed from all of these locomotives. Any more questions, Bill? Go on to holiday traffic. Um, I think we'll do them at the end. There, there's a few, but no, we'll carry on at the moment. Yeah, it's fine. But all of these non patriotic activities were of very little concern to the government. What they were worried about was the unpatriotic desire to take a holiday during the war. Holiday traffic. At first, it was business as usual. Throughout the war period, the civilian population appeared never to lose its desire to travel away from the drudgery of the workplace at bank holidays or to spend a week or two in their favourite holiday resort, such as Blackpool. During the phony war period, the government fully understood the need for workers to take holidays and announced that the railways should provide services in wartime on condition that they were, as they put it, as far as possible compatible with their performance duty. But there was concern about, hol about holiday traffic travel and this early poster shows. This particular poster was based on one of the six used in the mass observation survey in autumn 1939. In the original artwork, the train was shown crossing a bridge, but here is the final version. The locomotive is clearly an LNER engine and as such would have had its number painted on the front buffer beam, but now has the initials BR displayed. Is this the first use of these famous initials? Prior to Dunkirk, the railways continued to provide additional trains during the holiday periods, which included Christmas 1939, which despite the appalling weather, was busier than Christmas 1938. The public and the railway companies noticed that the Ministry's apparent lack of any precise travel on the list... Oh, excuse me, can I start again? The Ministry's apparent lack of any precise policy on leisure travel, so the railways remained very keen to provide a, a holiday service during the summer of 1940, and made their preparation for what was hoped to be a busy summer of holiday services. The first significant holiday following the ice-stricken Christmas of 1939 was Easter in March 1940. Thousands of London residents left the city for short breaks in the country or at the coastal regions, while many of the recently evacuated civil servants travelled in, in the opposite direction to their homes around London. The GWR declared that, that traffic was even heavier than in peacetime and on Good Friday every booking office window at Paddington Station was open as there were so many passengers queuing to buy their tickets. As for the summer traffic, the Ministry of Tra Transport and the REC had discussions about the provision of additional trains to enable the public to travel coastal resorts for their annual summer holidays. By mid-May 1940, the railway companies had made their full preparations to provide the series of holiday trains at reduced fares. But of course, the railway's excursion plans for the summer of 1940 were over-optimistic. On 10th May 1940, the German army began the invasion of the Low Countries, leading to the surrender of the Dutch government only four days later. With the increasing threat of invasion, the government did more than just plead with the populace to forego their wits and holiday and remain at work and avoid all unnecessary travel. It enlisted the assistance of King George VI, who issued a royal pro proclamation cancelling the bank holiday. All of the extra train service scheduled for Whitson in the summer were duly cancelled. With the threat of imminent invasion from Dun after the Dunkirk retreat, the Ministry of Home Security issued an official order creating what he described as a defence area along the coast from the Wash to Rye in Sussex, soon afterwards extended further west to the Isle of Wight, which extended 20 miles inland. Only residents were permitted to travel in this area unless they had a genuine business need, and the police were expected to enforce this order, which specifically barred anybody making a journey for holiday or pleasure purposes. Rather than produce a map, perhaps it was reason this would have been assistance to the enemy, the extent of the defence area was conveyed to the public by a list of railway stations that they could not buy tickets to without having a very good reason for visiting the area. This was a blow to the Southern Railway as leisure travel in the southern and eastern extremities of their area was eliminated. I spoke to one octogenarian who, when asked did he remember how crowded the trains were during the war, he at first answered, no difference, but then clarified this with a comment, but there was nowhere to go. Of course, the then small boys railway travel would usually have been from his home in mid-Sussex to one of the near, many nearby coastal resorts. 
The lack of holiday travel to the south coast was a bonus to the GWR, who experienced additional holiday traffic on their route into Devon and Cornwall. The next phase in the, was holidays at home policy. By 1941, the government seemed to realise that no matter what, many hardworking war workers were desperate for a holiday. It recognised the necessity of for these work, factory workers engaged in essential war work to have a summer holiday, but still keeping as many people off the railways as was possible. Thus, the notion of holidays at home was proposed. In 1941, the REC were first told about this proposal by Gilbert Slumper, but little more was done that year. For despite the pleas for the government, the railways continued to carry out what they believed was their legal obligation, which was to carry the traffic that presented itself, even to the extent of adding extra trains to their reduced wartime timetables. For example, on Saturday the 21st of June 1941, the LMS provided 71 extra trains, many of which were overcrowded, such as the 8.42 a.m. from Manchester, Victoria to Blackpool, which took 1,800 holidaymakers to the seaside. The following week, the Southern ran eight additional Saturday extras to Bournemouth and the West Country, all of which were overcrowded. On the same day, the Great Western Railway ran 12 extra trains to the Western Paddington, and these included the Cornish Riviera Express, which ran as five separate trains, the fifth of which carried 900 passengers. During 1942 and 1943, the government's stated policy was that everybody must take their holiday at home. It was proved difficult to enforce this unpopular policy, but all the local authorities and other organisations were requested to organise a variety of events in their towns. But one Labour MP representing a Lancashire mill town opined that why should anybody stay at home in such a dreary town when the Blackpool beach was only an hour away by train? This cartoon on the right, I'm not sure where I got it from, but it looks like a Giles cartoon, is amusing, but one senses a subtext. It is a lowly railway one who seems to be enforcing the policy locally, not the government in Whitehall. In line with the government's policy, however, and despite many misgivings, many of the local authorities did accept the government's challenge and organised events to tempt residents away from the fun and frolics to be enjoyed at the seaside resorts. It was hoped that the local lidos and parks would provide, prove a substitute for the sea and the beaches. In Harrogate, where you recall there was a substantial London diaspora, since whole families had been evacuated and were sheltering from the horrors of the Blitz, thousands of the town's Spa Town's residents and others from the surrounding area were entertained by watching or partaking in a big athletic meeting held on the Harrogate Cricket Ground. There was also other events, including a Victory Garden show, which was held in the car parking area at the Royal Hall, a road walking race and a children's pet show, which had over 800 entries. At the conclusion of the three weeks of activities, the Mayor of Harrogate opined that holidays at home had been a success and they had not received a single complaint from either a resident or a visitor. Overall, however, the policy has been only a partial success. For while many did, did remain at home, the REC was not entirely sure how many holiday makers had not taken their usual single long journey to the seaside, but instead they had many, many local days out and still used the trains. The third phase of holiday traffic was when it became unpatriotic to travel. With Operation Bolero ramping up, more military traffic on the railways meant less room for holiday traffic. It was now time to revive the Is Your Journey Really Necessary campaign, which the REC REC had decided a year or so early needed to be rested for a while as its impact had diminished. The ver this version of the poster is much more aggressive. The soldier barring the way to the ticket office is clearly stating that your means you. Whatever good reason you may think you may think you have to travelling on the trains. In early 1944, Ernest Bevan, who you will recall was the Minister of Labour and National Service, proclaimed that it was unpatriotic to take a journey during war holiday journey during wartime. But he did fall short of instigating any formal prohibition on holiday traffic. Despite the propaganda, most of the public believed they'd earned a holiday. Just prior to D-Day, the heavy traffic on the railways as part of Operation Overlord increased dramatically. 
With ever more military traffic on the railways leading up to D-Day 1944, the government and the RAC propaganda became more strident with the slogan, which was prim primarily aimed at those who planned holidays, a stark, do not travel. The railway magazine promoted this message on the front cover of their July-August 1944 edition, printed before Day Day, but was being distributed a short while afterwards. Much to the disdain of a correspondent in the next issue, who possibly summed up the public's attitude towards being branded and unpatriotic in respect to holiday travel, wrote, One can get a lot of propaganda at the railway stations in the daily press. Do let us keep it clear of the railway magazine. During the D-Day invasion, a stand-to period existed. Trains were cancelled without any notice or explanation. And, as the second poster implies, after the invasion, troops and supplies still had to be moved by rail. A few conclusions. In respect to overcrowding on passenger trains, the Great Western stated that 60 million passenger journeys had been made in 1944, which was a 64% increase compared to the last full year of peace in 1938. While the railway's passengers travel greater distances, the total passenger train mileage was 10 million miles, which was 23% less than in 1938. Less trains, more passengers, must have created overcrowding at times, but not necessarily at all times. The other railways published similar results. The increase in passenger numbers was due to several reasons, including the dispersal of government apartments and factories to remote that were remote from the capital. Service personnel, often for travel often for pleasure not for military business purposes was often the tipping point in creating overcrowded trains the assertion that rail fares costed three times as much is difficult to justify many traveled at concessionary rates uh, inflation overall during the war year was about 50 percent the abolition of cheap day returns would have increased fares many more reasons to travel during the war biggest unknown is the numbers traveling to visit evacuated family members who were not part of the official evacuation schemes. Unfortunately, passenger services deteriorated towards the end of the war due to shortages of serviceable locomotives and rolling stock. And it's, as I say, it's commercial time. The book, it was due out when it was, um, ooh, I think 1999 was the introduction point. It's £25 on the cover, but I think you can get it cheaper than that. Okay. Okay. That's that. Well, Thank well, you. Brilliant stuff, Peter. And uh, folks, I will add the actual link to Peter's book as soon as this show is done. I'll add it to the description, but you can see it there. And I'm going to um, ask Peter some of our questions now, which have been building up uh, uh, as we've been going on. So um, to in no particular order, Peter, um, here, here they are. So the first one is, uh, did any of the trains, well, well, sorry, how much did they slow down the trains to increase capacity? capacity. Um, that's a good question. And I know the answer. You want a percentage decrease? Well, I mean, well, I mean, only roughly. I mean, just give us an idea. I mean, did, what were they? And give us a give us a, a sort of a ballpark figure. Increase in journey times. Um, sometimes it was as much as forty percent increase in journey times on the longer runs. I did a breakdown in the um, in the book, but it varied from um, place to place. Some places it was only ten percent longer and. The Midland Division, for instance, was 40%. LNE a Great Eastern, it was 40% increase. Probably averages at about 30% increase in times. Okay, okay, thank you. Another one, and I'm going to reword it slightly differently. The Great Dominion is asking about track repair. So he's saying, how often were tracks inspected for wear and possible signs of sabotage during the war? Were there any major derailments with heavy loss of life in Britain during World War II? So you can address that, but I'm also going to kind of say, did did railway maintenance or, uh, or suffer generally during the during the war because of conscription and shortages, or, or did it carry on carry on as normal? Well, it, it from my understanding is that it, it they did in, increase maintenance times. There was less maintenance, and things did get very 
track like everything else suffered from ma lack of maintenance i mean the worst things were the locomotives and things that there were lines and lines of locomotives out of service because there wasn't um any uh any maintenance on them um i haven't i can have a, i can't recall any any um stories about sabotage i think on the whole i think the the british public were were pretty good at um you know keeping an eye out for such things i don't i, I don't think there was any i can never seen any any comments about sabotage um and i don't think there was any any major derailments can't think of any of any crashes during the war that were significant other than signaling failures or um most of the sort of the damage to the railways was what i described as several i mean like that one at um uh that was on the slide i mean uh, where was it gone now in the northeast and that was oh, a, yeah. that that was a they had that cleared within a couple of days and it's incredible what was done um i think that was one of the great success, successes really was how they kept things moving in very difficult circumstances and if there was um and very often railmen would uh go down on going in the blackout would go down to inspect track for damage before the trains would pass and they'd be going into the unknown really there might be bombs there or anything it's incredible bravery showed by an awful lot of railwaymen okay well okay, thanks well. for that and we've got another question with an early one from rob crane uh did they try and encourage commuters onto trams and the underground in london to try and free up the trains i wonder and also possibly buses or then maybe you have the issue of fuel and things like that but but did they try and encourage people to use other means of transport no it was discouragement um the green line services were discontinued long distance coaches stopped um in london i don't think it made an awful lot of difference um the trams and that were still running um because it's all part of the london passenger transport board i mean if, okay. if it was okay. if, if if you use the bus if it's convenient to train if it's not okay thanks okay. another one from kevin guess i kind of asked you this one earlier but i'm putting it in again were there any efforts or proposals to create a priority list of passengers so you're talking about factory workers the people going to bletchley park the royal naval personnel going to bath and what have you um did they try and sort of spread people's journeys over different times of day by organizing priority schedule or was it all kind of left to the whim of the the, the passenger passenger i think it just got left to sort itself out um the, the railways were, pr were pretty good at, at meeting need um i think i think i'll get the impression from a lot of the correspondence just let us get on with our job you go away we'll provide the we'll provide the service don't interfere we don't like your suggestions we know what we're doing um they they'd have put um if there was for instance um as you say if there's if it was a holiday time and they might put on a relief train from harrogate or something that's the kind of thing they did they okay. were pretty good at spotting the what the traffic was going to be okay thanks so my the question my last one is from me really and it, we talk a lot on this channel with guests about how movies have influenced our perception of things like you know the spitfire and the battle of britain or the, the the soldier at war trains i mean i'm thinking of classic movies you know brief encounter and there's hanover street with harrison ford and people on those crowded trains do you find that the movie representation of trains in the war has kind of left us this idea they were always full and uh, do, do, has it helped or hindered people like your research is uh, your, your research in this subject uh, well brief encounter was after the war wasn't it yeah, um, but it's, yeah but it's, it's that sort of that sort of thing yeah um i i, I expect i expect the cliches come up but um I can't honest, honestly think of any films that I've seen that, that, that would make me decide either way, really. Um, generally, the representation of railways on TV and uh, and films is pretty poor. <laughs> A lot of dreadful inaccuracies. And it's getting yeah, worse. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're into the whole military uh, history and, and accuracy in history. But Peter, it's been fantastic talking to you. I will add the link to your um, to your book in the description afterwards, folks. Don't forget, there's nothing this weekend, but next week we start our Anzio series. Not just Anzio, there's other things happening in Italy at the same time. So some great guests. We've got Rangers, we've got 
uh, first special service force we've got james holland we've got um brad is on from otd military history we've got some great guests coming your way so as always don't forget to like and subscribe leave us a comment after the show if you've enjoyed it and i will say add the link to peter's book in the description below but right now i'm going to say thank you very much for your watching thank you very much for your questions and i will see you all again after the weekend this is paul Woodard from world war ii tv saying enjoy the rest of your day cheers everybody bye <laughs>